going to announce us all and then I'll speak. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, I welcome you all uh, to this session called uh, Unhealing Boots. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce the moderator for this session. Dr. Nadia Chishti Mujahid. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Sciences and Liberal Arts in the School of Economics and Social Sciences at IBA Karachi. She is the author of the monograph titled Fraternal Male Twinship in History, Society, Fiction and Entertainment. Previously, she wrote a book titled The Political Chess King as well. So, uh, I would like everyone to please give her a round of applause. And uh, I would... I would also request Nadia to kindly introduce us uh, to the speakers as well. Right. Thank you very much, Fazil. So, yeah, my claim to fame is that I work at the same institute as H.M. Nakhvi's wife, uh, Alia. I know Kamla's parents who are sitting right there in front of me. And I've taught Uzma's um, cousin. Jokes aside, well, that those aren't jokes. That those are connections. But we have here three of the finest writers in um, English language Pakistani fiction. I'm very honored to be here and uh, I'm delighted that HM is on site and the ladies are uh, on Zoom with us. And yes, the topic is unhealed wounds and partition, but we'll kind of build up to that because I think it's really important for the um, audience to get a sense of uh, how far these three have come in their careers, how vital they are to Pakistani literature and fiction, and um, how um, sensitively they've worked on anything they've written, whether it be related to partition or not. Agent um, Nakhvi here, in fact, none of them need an introduction, and he doesn't either, but it's polite to introduce the person, is the or is a prize-winning author, they all are, um, and uh, he's written Homeboy and Abdullah the Kosa, which is a, a superb book. Please, please, if you read it, don't skip the footnotes, they are delightful. Um, you really miss out. Uh, if you do, it, it's easier for me to um, handle footnotes because I'm an academic, but um, it, they're worth it. And uh, so uh, I really recommend it. Um, Kamla Shamsi also needs no introduction. Um, I'm extremely familiar with her books about in every stone and home fire, but she's written a number of others and is currently working on more. And um, she has been writing for a long time um, and is kind of um, an icon really by this point in spite of being very young, uh, relatively young for, um, for an author. I mean, she's um, still in her 40s, I think, late 40s. Um, and um, she's established a sort of mini from, uh, Kamla Shamsi canon within uh, literature and is very, very important for uh, Pakistani writers in general, be they male or female. Usma Aslam Khan is a multiple prize winner because she wants to be. Uh, she is very committed to her craft, very committed to her writing. 
Um, and it involves tremendous painstaking research. Um, uh, the book Nomi Ali, uh, it's got a long title, but I can't remember, but I reviewed it very, very thoroughly. We'll speak more about it. It's about Kalapani and the Andaman Islands. And I, um, uh, I find her multi-layered work and her precision in terms of writing to be uh, truly arresting. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is address a question to each of them and then there'll probably be a sort of collective discussion which we hope will interest you. So, um, HM, you know, one of the most impressive things about you is how you manage to always get to the heart of a matter whether you're writing fiction or whether you're sitting and talking this way. Yes, that's a talent. And I remember once um, where you were speaking about the Iowa Writers Workshop and you said, uh, you know, I want people who are writing, especially aspiring writers, to know that it's a very lonely life, right? It's you and the work. And yesterday I was speaking to young writers like Taha Kehar and uh, Mira Siti, and I mentioned this. Um, loneliness, aside, um, you know, you are very well known, you are extremely talented, you're a famous name. How do you reconcile those oppositional uh, stances? Um, <clears throat> thank you uh, for uh, uh, your generous uh, introduction and, uh, and um, you know, I've been writing since I was a child. Um, writing has been a constant. It's uh, the way that I contend with myself and the world around me. Um, and uh, so in a way, um, I have been in self-isolation uh, for about half uh, a century. And I have uh, experience in this uh, and in, 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 in the way the world has configured itself in the last two years. Um, and I um, thrive, I like to think, or I tell myself, I, I thrive in, in, uh, this, in this mode of being. Um, I often find myself out of sorts in, um, at forums like these. It's, it's not, I'm not in my natural element. I'm, I'm a writer, not a speaker, and, and, and hence I talk haltingly, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's not natural. You're doing just fine. Right. Um, Kamala, <clears throat> uh, you've been writing for years and getting better and better. Can you hear me? She can't hear me, sir. Someone will have to do something about the sound. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, now I can hear you. So you've been writing for years, and you're just getting mm -hmm. better all the time. And I was very impressed with Home Fire, because it portrays an authentic relationship between twins. Okay? And I have read 40,000 pages on twins in the past four years, because it's my academic interest. Um, so, everybody got very excited about the Antigone myth, but the twin part is spot on. It's very difficult to get it spot on if you're not a twin, and if you have, or if you haven't read a great deal about it. And yet I feel um, that a lot of your work moves with instinct, uh, in that, of course, it's well researched, it's thorough, and we'll, we'll look into this question of research further, especially when I get to Usma next, because of the topic itself. But, inter you know, could you talk about that balance between the research that you do, uh, for example, on Peshawar, for A God in Every Stone, and the instinctive way in which you move in terms of your writing and to write characters and look at them and rewrite them, such as with Young, for example. Could you comment a fair bit further on that? Well, I think every writer wants to work to some of their some of the readers as though you are functioning of instinct, but I mean the truth is you write and you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite and it is a mixed thing that the early drafts that probably, you know, 
instinct or following ideas if they come along is yeah, is a big part of it. Uh, and as a result, my first drafts are often very messy and unbeatable, and I would be covered in shame if they were published. Um, you know, and and then you go back to the redrafting process, and that's actually where you try and take more control of the narrative. So I think that, and it's the same with actually, I think, you know, we separate these things, research and instinct, as though they're separate matters. Um, with research, and I mean, both HM and Uzma, I'm sure you want to speak to this, um, you have to know what it is you need to research. I mean, you know, um, the Andaman Islands, you could research, I mean, you could spend a century in your entire life researching different aspects, and you have to have, I think, with fiction writers, a sense of what kind of things do I need to know? What is useful? You stumble accidentally, and this certainly happened to me with the Garden Every Stone and, and the Birch Hatch. You stumble upon one tiny bit of, one tiny detail in your research that you weren't looking for, and it opens up a new avenue of possibilities for the novel, and then you, you know, the sort of plot and research and you see all these things very much go together. So I don't see them as separate qualities. You know, it, it's more as if your sort of your right your brain is all almost sort of on saying, what can I use? What is helpful? What things I can put organically be part of this mm -hmm. right now very messy thing that I'm trying to create. Right. Um, and now Osma, we can move on to you and then on to the whole partition point uh, and uh, sort of let the discussion flow a bit further. So as I said and I'm going to expound on this. I was enormously impressed by the research that you put into uh, No Me Ali. And I wasn't the only one by any means. Um, I know that when I reviewed it, I said, well, I mean, it gets too historical at times. But um, as I said, it was a backhanded compliment. Um, it's a dense book. It's a very, very important book. And it's obviously uh, a labor of love, but also very, very intensively researched. Um, You've looked at uh, the horrific star-shaped prison with seven arms, only three of which remain today. Um, you've looked at methods of torture of the British and, um, uh, in India, which were methods of control at the time. And, um, and of course, it's all seen through the eyes. Of, well, much of it is seen through the eyes of a prisoner, an unnamed prisoner, and then a young, a little girl. And. Um, so I want to um, uh, let you go ahead and move into commenting on your own writing for that and, and anything else you want to comment on in terms of you know, your other books such as Geometry of God or Thinner Than Skin, but your own writing and how you feel that ties into um, the topic of unhealed wounds in terms of Pakistan, in terms of India, in terms of partition, and in terms of history in general. Thank you, Nadia, for my question. Uh, if at any point you're not able to hear me, please uh, just say something. So just to um, go back to your question of research, um, I mean, the miraculous true history of Romeo Lee did begin with an accident. I had actually gone to the library to for another book. Uh, which I did not find, and then I saw this book on the Andaman Islands, which I thought was interesting, and so I put it off the shelf. Actually, it wasn't even on the Andaman Islands yet, it was some other book. Um, and there was a quote uh, about from a British official back in the 1930s mentioning a paradise, a prisoner of paradise. And I, you know, I had heard of Kalapani, as we all have, um, but I really didn't know anything more than it being a place of dread, a place of fear, a place to which, you know, uh, Indian terrorists were, were banished. Um, and, and I feel that, um, there, you know, a spark was lit. I mean, that, that's often how things begin. It's just this hunger to know what I don't know, a sort of interrogation of why I don't know, why wasn't I taught this? Um, and from there, it just sort of went from one thing to another. And, and what I realized uh, as I was getting deeper into trying to find out more about this is that, you know, I was really writing into a void. I mean, how do you access and erase history from archives that don't exist? Because I, I wasn't 
finding much. Um, and, and what I did find at the time, I didn't realize it, but over, you know, over the years, because this book took me almost 20 single years to finish. Um, over the years, I, I realized that it, it, it wasn't just that I needed to find the archives, it was that the archives were were written by, you know, we you know that history is written by white men primarily. Mm. And so I wasn't able to trust the archives. They, they weren't telling the truth. Mm. Um, since they've been constructed by power and, and the, the purpose was to actually erase the history, not to to shed light on it. So um, I also did find passing references to women prisoners, and this interested me very much. And but then I didn't find very very much uh, other than just fleeting references the social and sexual stigma around the life uh, of women in the prison colony meant that they were barely ever mentioned. And so I, the first character I wrote for the book, which is actually the first character I wrote for any novel was the prisoner, the woman prisoner, who at the time had a name, but later on, I sort of honored the fact that, um, you know, women are written out of those three, so I, I just gave her a number, the number that would have been on her prisoner tag that she wore around her neck. Um, so, I think at some point I actually just stopped caring about what had or had not been said, and, and uh, if anything, not finding all the facts began to excite me, because it, it forced me to imagine from scratch and to unlearn, not just to learn, but to unlearn. Um, and I realized there was freedom in not having a script. And um, and so I started taking liberties with these facts and the fiction more than the, the facts are, you know, what, what was consuming me. And it's the license I was giving myself to create both my own fiction, but also in a sense my own archives. Great, thanks. Um, okay, and that leads me now into uh, you know Amhi Boon's politician, politician fiction, um, and the following question can be addressed by all of you in turn, or rather lead into a discussion. Of course, no um, panel on this topic would be complete without me at least mentioning Babsi Silva's Cracking India, a Scandi Man or and um, that ended up being considered the partition novel for a number of years, although others have, I'm sure, alluded to it or written on it and so on. And but I'm, I don't, I feel awkward saying this because you all have, I've gone ahead and extensively praised your research abilities and I'm still going to do it by saying that HM has done the most brilliant job of researching Karachi for Abdullah the Cossack. I mean, I love Abdullah. Uh, book lover, uh, sort of a food lover, uh, just a uh, man after my own heart. But, you know, uh, in terms of Garden East and uh, the Yahudi Masjid and, uh, you know, things of that nature, it's, it's a brilliantly researched book. And there I am praising, you know, Sati Kamala's research in Peshawar and, and obviously bowing before the Andaman Island research of Nami Ali. But at the end of the day, dudes, you're not historians. Your creative writers, all three of you, as is Sidla. So what we're getting in terms of um, what we read is, um, it, to some degree, stuff that's historical based, but also an escape from that into creativity, into um, sort of, you know, the God in every stone, or the God in every pen stroke of your writings. So, um, so could you address this and then how much are you guys to be trusted in terms of um, partition and um, how you present it, or just history and how you present it? They say um, the news is the first draft of, of history. And then, of course, um, textbooks would be the, the revised draft. Uh, the canonical draft. Um, I would posit that uh, novels can serve as the third draft. And so, you know, you want to think about uh, Tolstoy um, and contending with the Napoleonic Wars in War and Peace. And um, you want to think about 
A Farewell to Arms, which is uh, set in World War I. Um, you want to talk, uh, you want to talk about Elie Wiesel's Night, which contends with the Holocaust. Um, and uh, in recent history, 9-11 uh, uh, has produced a uh, genre of, uh, of literature because novelists like, like you in your discipline and like all of us in the audience have are compelled to make sense of the world. And, and um, in that way, if you were merely to read news reports about World War I or textbooks, you won't understand the visceral um, experience of going through war without reading, I would posit, A Farewell to Arms. Um, as far as uh, partition literature goes, um, there is no doubt that uh, uh, Babsi Sidwa's uh, I Scandi Man is uh, a, an important work, um, and Manto is often uh, has become the quintessential partition uh, uh, writer. Um, although, if you you know if you if you survey all of Manto's work, you know Manto Nama hai, Manto Rama hai, trilogy hai, uh, uh, partition uh, plays actually a small part in his oeuvre. Uh, but there is of that generation, my my late friend of the of the Hussain, Das Nasle, which uh, he himself translated into the varied generations, which contends with uh, partition. There's Kurutalain Heather's Akadaria. There's my friend Mustansar Hussain Tara's Rak, and so um, that generation, um, like uh, like every generation, was contending with history. Kamla, would you like to go ahead and contribute to that? I think, I think it's a very interesting question to say, you know, how much do we, how much do we trust which writers? I think the, the question, and, and Usman sort of touched upon this when talking about who is writing the history and what's in there. Who do you trust on partition? Uh, you know, which version of the story you would listen to? And, and you go to India, there's one kind, of, actually there's not one kind, there are many, many kinds of stories in Pakistan, there are many, many kinds of stories. Yes, there are certain agreed on facts. And if you want those, you can go possibly directly to the archive um, and see minutes of original meetings and what was said in Parliament and what was you know, recorded in the minutes of Muslim meetings. I mean, you, you do have all that kind of facts and data, and no novelist would replicate the work there. Um, but when you have the questions of what can men um, in different terms, in sort of emotional terms, in the fighting terms, uh, I, I would go to novels or some novel for that. And I think it's not only the other ones. I mean, we talk of um, Scandi Man, we talk of Mancho, we talk of Crazy Box, and these are fantastic works of fiction. For me, possibly the best work in the English language on, on partition is Anita decides to get a day, which we almost never talk to in the partition novel because it's about one family in one house then in the years just after the partition. But if you read it, it is a psychological portrait of partition and its aftermath. And it's brilliantly and beautifully done. And I would trust Anita Desai on that and on seeing things that are really valuable. Because when we talk about unbelievable, we are talking about in part cycle. Uh, and and I think a, a writer like Anita Desai really does that with such elegance as the elegance. Usman, could we get your input? Thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll give you a, a, an example, if I can, just from, uh, you know, the miraculous true history of Nomi, Nomi Ali at the end of the book. Um, and I don't want to give away too much. But partition refugees are coming to the islands. And so it's a pre-partition novel. It's set during the 30s and then 40s. So it's about the British occupation as well as the Japanese occupation. But then it does go to 1947, right at partition, 
and partition refugees start coming to the islands. Um, and one of the things that really sort of is moving and horrifying about this is that first the British sent Indians to these islands as a way to remove them, right? Remove them from history, remove them from memory, remove them from place. I mean, the, when the British sent them, they said it, it was a way to sever them from caste, creed, and family, and from every possession held here. These were, these, this was the exact quote. Um, and so at partition, you know, refugees start coming to these islands, and again, they're being uh, separated from every possession. Held dear. Um, and the question that is asked then and then is asked throughout the book is sort of what is left of the living with the death of the past? And, and so this, you know, then how do we sort of recreate that past? Of course, we're, we're making it up. And um, should we be trusted? Uh, probably not. I mean, it's, you know, it's just one version. And that's, that's the point, right? Is that Every history we get is just one history, and there are many histories, and we need to continue to retell them. Um, uh, so for me, one thing that, that I realized when writing this book was that I was actually drawing a little bit from my father's family's partition history. Uh, you know, they crossed the border from India and Punjab and, and came to the war, um, and yet, you know, I don't think I even ever heard him call his family refugees, um, but they were, or I never spoke of the violence of partition. Um, and there was just one incident that, that really haunted me, which I did hear about, was, was my paternal grandmother told me about just the killing of her parents. Um, and it, it was very gruesome. Uh, so when I started writing the book, um, what happened to Nomi's father, Tegarani, turned into a kind of inversion of sorts of what my great grandparents went through. Um, and so this, this was just my way, in some way, of, of sort of uh, making sense of what I had heard because it didn't make sense to me and also it came down to me from someone else's memory. So, so just, you know, these layers of memory and story, I suppose, is what I'm saying slightly round and way, but I do, I do think that that's what we do as, as history makers and storytellers, is, is we are playing with the facts and we are really in the language and languages are finding concern. But just to come back to your question of partition novels, uh, I mean, I read Train to Pakistan by Kushman Singh and, you know, for what they by Father Patrick Manto at a very young age. Both were given to me by my father. Maybe he's not sharing uh, some of what he had experienced through someone else's imagination. Um, he also gave me stories by Amita Pritam to read. And uh, honestly, on my first reading of Pritam, I'm not sure what I understood. I don't think I really thought that this was, you know, she was writing about partition. I think what I felt very intensely was the soulfulness of the the heartache, um, and I began to associate it with my family, for me, love and heartache and loss. And then, of course, deeper in life, also my family life. Um, so all of these moved me greatly, but one thing is that we were not historical novels. We're reading them, them now as, as, you know, historical fiction, but they were written by people who lived through the experience, right? So that's, that's very different. Um, for me, what helped me write about an experience that I didn't actually live through and to give permission to do that, because I say that in, in our country, that permission is not given. I, I don't think I was encouraged to do that. I think it's always, like, you know, what can you possibly know when you didn't do it? Um, but that's what historical fiction writers do. We are writing about a time and place that we are not able to access, but that is, but that has been given to us intergenerationally because we're carrying these memories and we're carrying these histories. So for me, one of the first books I read by a writer who was writing about a time and place that he could not have lived through was uh, actually by a Latin American writer, a book called Genesis, and it's the first book in a trilogy called Memory of Fire. Um, Galliano wrote an epic history of Latin America for over hundreds of years, and 
um, it was way bigger than anything I could have possibly attempted. But I think it was formative in giving me permission to explore the genesis of Pakistan by writing about the pre-partition. Um, and and there are, there's another book uh, called The Known World by Edward P. Jones. Um, he's a black American writer writing about slavery in the U.S. So overall, I think it is black and brown writers, South Asian and from across continents, um, writing about colonialism, racism, forced transportation, internalized violence um, that have allowed you know the the me to sort of generate language um, and engage with my own history. Thank you so Can much. Has any one ever written a humorous? novel on partition. I mean, I don't think that they can, perhaps, but, you know, I just, uh, it was a very serious topic, but, you know, humor keeps people going. Okay. Um, oh, was Kamla saying something? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I would say that, and, and again, picking up from what Usma said is, you know, so on one hand, there are historical accounts that are written by people in power. I think one of the things that has been happening in the last several decades is, is oral testimonies. And I think particularly sort of at the end of the last century, there were a number of people who realized that those who lived in Pakistan were adults that were you know, a resource that had to be used. Um, but, but there's one book that I want to, to mention, which is um, Adam Zakaria's The Footprints of Pakistan, which is non-fiction, but it's taken into it four generations. And I think that's a really interesting thing to this not just those who live through partition as adults, um, and it's not just their children who are very young, and it's not their grandchildren, which is what all of us are now. We have grandparents who I think we all knew, we heard their stories, we knew people who had grown up in pre partition in India had lived through that whole experience. I think the really interesting thing is, is the generation that comes after and what partition is to them. And, and one of the things that, that is sort of quite horrifying in the in, in book is that through that fourth generation, partition has nothing to do with the English. There's no colonial rule. And it's about you know, Pakistan getting freedom from India and Hindu. Um, and really, when you read things like that, you think that there has been an absolute failure to tell the stories of partition. Um, you know, and, and for all that we... It, Partition is this weird thing, and, and you know, a few years ago I was in, in Sarajevo, and, and I was talking to people who lived through the war in the 90s, and it was fascinating because I would hear two points of view about the war. One was, we need to stop going on about the war, we never stop talking about it, and the other one was, no one talks about the war. Um, and you sort of have that feeling about partition as well, that it's always there, and yet it's not really ever them into and talk about, which is why you can have this fourth generation with such an odd notion of history. Yeah. Can I go ahead and speak now? I mean, is that all right? Are you guys on? Are you on? Yeah. Okay. No, I was just going to move on to something else which grows out of this, um, which is that, um, I mean, you know, there's a famous thesis by Aisha Jalal which is that Jinnah never wanted Pakistan. And, and this is an academic thesis that to, to date hasn't really been shaken. Okay. And um, somebody brought this up at the IBA now. I was at one of the talks, and one of the students just said, you know, um, and you know, a bit typical sort of ingenuousness, um, well, if he didn't want Pakistan, then what are we all doing here? And it's been 70 years. So I guess we're here to stay, all right? So hogeya, partition. And now let's move forward. And we must remember that the, the, the millennial generation um, isn't as connected to partition, okay, as perhaps we are because of our parents, and certainly our parents are deeply connected to it. So the point being, of course, that whether the thesis is valid uh, fully or not, um, you know, the unhealed wounds mentioned in the topic of this discussion, um, a novelist might have the power to heal them somehow, depending on what they write and how they use their talent, all right? Uh, and I just wondered what your thoughts on that were, in that, you know, you're not really supposed to leave wounds unhealed. You're supposed to attend to them, you're supposed to fix them. 
and do novelists have a moral responsibility in Pakistan to do that regarding the partition? I will answer uh, your question um, in this way. Um, I happen to have a uh, fantastic and slim uh, volume of history uh, on me. And if you uh, allow me, uh, I will read a passage from uh, Walpert's um, Shameful Flight. It is uh, in the beginning, and it's an anecdote um, about a, well, Walpert writes, when asked how he felt about his Indian Viceroyalty 18 years after partition, Mountbatten himself admitted to BBC's John Ospen when they sat next to one another at dinner shortly after the 1965 Indo-Pakistani War that, quote, he got it wrong. Osman felt, quote, sympathy for the remorseful 65-year-old ex-viceroy and tried to cheer him up, but to no avail. Thirty-nine years after that meeting, he recalled, Osman recalled, quote, Mountbatten was not to be consoled. To this day, his own judgment on how he had performed in India rings in my ears and in my memory. As one who dislikes the tasteless use in writing of vulgar slang, I shall permit myself an exception this time because it is the only honest way of reporting accurately what the last Viceroy of India thought about the way he had done his job. Quote, I effed up. So, you know, we like to think that Jinnah had agency, Nehru had agency, uh, perhaps by, uh, you know, and Mount, Mount, Mount Batten had agency, and, and the dynamics that, the historical momentum that yielded this, this seismic uh, uh, socio-political cataclysm um, has to be uh, looked at by different historians and, and different novelists of different generations and, and interpret um, what happened, and and then so you know there, there there might be an orthodoxy about what happened, and and uh, if you'll allow me, I'll read a, a heterodox, a very short heterodox footnote from a biography of um, I came across recently of uh, this fellow named Abdullah the Cossack, yeah, an old denizen of Karachi who did uh, inhabit, as you recall, our niece. In uh, footnote 47, he writes, if the Brits had vision, the subcontinent would not have, would have been arranged, if the Brits had vision, the subcontinent would have been arranged sensibly like, like, like Europe. After all, the subcontinent was a collection of 572 states. Partition is a preposterous misnomer. What was there to part? The best arrangement would have been a federation of five, six unions, the Republic of the Indus, United States of South Asia, and so on. The Bengalis would have been delighted to have Bengal all to themselves, ditto for the Punjabis and the Punjab. But the British imposed their bizarre vision for disparate people, disparate lands, for an area larger than Europe. Europe might be some subcontinent. We are the continent. There's the humorous novel right there. You <laughs> must expand on it. I love it a lot. Kamla, would you like to comment now? Oh. One second, the sound went, so, but then I heard the, the work of this, and I didn't hear the other one, so you must send me an example. Um, so I'm going to respond, I think, to Nadia's question, which is about whether writers have a moral responsibility. First of all, writers have no different moral responsibility to anyone else who has different platforms and perhaps audiences. 
Um, but we, you know, I, I don't think we should turn us into more powerful creatures that we are. Why our people are not to do that stuff like that? Uh, it's got nothing to do with history. It's got nothing to do with how good or bad the writing of Pakistan has been by its writers. Is it a continuing rule because of the politicians in general that should do with the continuing um, politics between India and Pakistan? Um, and of course, you know, the students that are very set to that. And there's nothing to do with that. We should be good. Um, you know, all we can do is find complicated stories that um, officials don't might want to find a lot that that really very crucial to do. Um, but with an understanding we're not the ones who will be Usma, I think Kamala's gone. Um yeah, I would agree. I I mean, this question, you know, I, sometimes the word redemption comes up a lot for writers. We get, I get asked this question, you know, it, it, do you, do you, why don't your books have redemption? Or why don't they have some offering? I'm not a therapist. I'm not a priest. I mean, I can't, I can't take on these roles. So I, I would agree uh, with Kamala there. I, I would also just add that, you know, um, when we're talking about unhealed wounds of partition, we are talking about everything before that, right? These are unhealed wounds of colonialism. And, and so one of, not only have we not been able to have open conversations about partition, but we're still not having conversations about colonialism. And um, just to come back to the Andaman Islands, you know, that's just one example of a large, ongoing sweep of colonial plundering and exploitation of human life and of non-human life of the environment. So, um, so for instance, there's this moment where, you know, the cost of war in, in indigenous tribes, for instance, because of underwater mines, like those mines completely displaced indigenous fishermen from their oldest and, uh, you know, most trusted ally, the sea. Um, this is just one way in which I had to sit with this displacement for a very long time and sit with the fact that this is just one. It's, you know, my family's displacement, everybody that I know, you know, has been displaced, our generations are being displaced. Um, and even before that part, I came to that part, uh, you know, one of the questions that haunted me was, despite the coconut groves and, and crystal bays that the British found in this pocket of the Bay of Bengal, you know, they, they looked at this beauty and turned it into a penal settlement, yeah. right? What is the mind that looks upon beauty and sees instead a means of torture? I mean, think about it even poor bloodedly to, to destroy all, all these, the indigenous people and lands and mm -hmm. seas, you have to work pretty hard and then you have to work hard to make other bodies um, prisoner bodies sort of do the hard work of producing those other bodies for you. And, and that's what the prisoners did. They were shipped to these islands not only to be punished and removed, but equally to domesticate the land and, and the water. So displaced prisoners did the job of displacing indigenous people. Uh, and these are the cycles of violence that we are still seeing. I mean, this is how empires are built. It's through deforestation forced occupation, forced transportation, you know, removal, extinction, these are the cycles of violence. So the colonial imagination bends toward ruin. And those of us who live in its fallout, you know, I don't know, but is it in our task to bend differently? I mean, that's pretty much all we can offer is, is through stories, through language, through our imagination, asserts the right to bend differently. And if in bending differently, we can offer something else, then um, then, then I, I take that as a compliment, but I definitely don't take that as my role. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Before, I mean, I think this is such an important topic and you've been listening so attentively, I want to give the last 15 minutes to you for questions. So please think about your questions, but I just have one for HMFV here, which is, you know, <clears throat> I love Abdullah the Kosak and, um, you know, hearing you read, etc. I have a quick question for you. 
is a little bit of a course I can alter ego of you. Um, yes. Um, and, and, and no. Uh, <laughs> um, all, I think, um, all protagonists, um, all of our protagonists are some sort of uh, uh, permutation of ourselves. Um, and uh, there is a bit of Abdullah the Cossack and me, and uh, a bit of me and him. <laughs> as long as Stanley Walpert and Mark Batten aren't haunting because of yours, it's all right. Um, do we have questions? Um, yes, please. Yeah, gentleman for microphone, did you? I would like to comment on your, uh, about unhealed wounds. I don't think it's the responsibility of the writers to heal these wounds. I think it's their responsibility to visit it in different ways, like Amos Shamsi said, and like, you know, they both said, uh, that's their job, to right. present different views, perspectives of partition to us. You know, only time will heal. Because it had a different meaning for my parents, it had a different meaning for me, and it will have a much different meaning for my grandchildren. So only time will be. Yeah. Thank you. I think it depends on what, what somebody is writing. I mean, if they are writing in a way where they wish to build bridges and repair things, etc. Well, given that India is a respected neighbor of ours uh, in terms of the United Nations, I mean, we can't pull up that sort of thing. But we are part of different men. But I just, um, this is a topic that uh, we consider very fundamentally important, but we have to look if there's a wound and some people here, and actually what you're going to take a feeling and do. Another question. Hmm. Okay, for the lady. Hi, my question is more general. Um, I've been kind of attending a lot of discussions where it says that a lot of South Asian writers pander to a Western narrative and um, you know indigenous stories and old voices is so important which I totally agree with. But then it does beg the question, does Pakistan have an inherent readership, enough of an inherent readership that we can self-sustain without pandering to the West? Will all three of you answer that in turn? Thanks. Did you guys hear that? Oh, sorry. I thought I thought the uh, internet was up. Um, I mean, you know, I've heard the pandemic for the last time in five years. It's, when I when I sit down to write a book, I show you I don't think what is the best one now and how do I do them. But I I'm aware that this is a a widely held belief, and and really the all you can do is read our books if that's all you see in their stock. Um, does Pakistan have enough? Of it? It, it depends on what you mean. I mean, it's the, the the population that is going to read, not just read English, but read the English language novel, you know, of a certain kind, um, is relatively small. But the question is, you know, in this day, if you can have a population house with small margins, um, this still able to produce books. I think what we're seeing now is, yes, and again, the last few years in Pakistan, we've had a number of in the text coming up. Um, and I think that is, the, the natural question that the one that expands the West and what goes on about, what people don't talk about is the number of Pakistani writers who are submitting stuff to publishers elsewhere and being rejected. And I think that is a very real and a very issue. And a lot of times it should be maybe their work isn't seen as suiting a particular market. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not a wonderful book. This means publishing houses in New York and London can't see how it's going to work for their sales. Um, and so we absolutely do need, I think, local publishing houses. Um, for a while, there were a number of writers who were getting published first in India. Uh, and because that was, you know, in many ways, historically must be closer, there was, I think, a much wider scope there for Pakistan writers. And I think this is one of the terrible Things of the unfilled wounds that actually the, that's getting much more difficult now, getting books across the border uh, is much more difficult, which is making it even more necessary than before. Uh, that Pakistan 
is being able to find a self-sustaining financial model for uh, an asset for 37,000. Someone is there who loves books and loves writing and has money to spare. Um, you know, get together with your friends, talk about setting up publishing house and how to support it. I don't mean on it. But the money doesn't need to go out of the house. Uh, but, but it would be a very worthwhile way of touching the basement, I think. And not just for the financial. Thank you, Melusma. Would you like to comment too? I mean, I'll just add very quickly that I am still one of those writers who um, all I have five novels, four of them have been published first in India. So, um, you know, why is it that Pakistani audiences are only going to read a book when it wins a prize in the UK or the US or when, you know, when, when, when mostly white writers give a stamp of approval? Why is there this inherent kind of feeling that unless those people uh, admire it or give it some kind of um, acclaim, then only is it worth our reading it. So I, I, I think this is a kind of internalized violence, actually. It's a way of erasing uh, communities within within the community. And, and it is one of the legacies of colonialism. And, and I think that we have we see this politically, we see this uh, in terms of literature and in the arts. I think just the struggles of brown and black people uh, is just so utterly and systemically normalized um, that it has become normalized within our communities as, as well. And, and it, it, it manifests in who we support and who we don't support. HM, would you like to say something? Um, I think. Uh, 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 question has been, been addressed, uh, addressed right. adequately. Any other questions? Could yes, young lady over there. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I was just wondering that partition and uh, everything related to it, it's pretty scary to deal with, to deal with. And one thing that I was just uh, uh, wondering was that is it easier to reckon with the unhealed wounds of partition in fiction as or as compared to non-fiction? Because it's much more imaginative than say narrative non-fiction or just non-fiction. It's just something that I was wondering if I asked. Okay. Um, you can go ahead first. Um, as uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, that, uh, that that fiction complements uh, discourse in reifying reality, and um, and you know, so again. Ili Wiesel's Night is complements the reportage on the Holocaust, and, and, and in this way, fiction plays that role. I think placing, I think, um, I, you know, this is a construct. Uh, the wounds healed, unhealed, these are constructs, and they're, they're, they're different ways of thinking about it. And, and um, you know, the. Partition in itself is also a construct. Uh, there are many countries that have experienced uh, such fundamental um, historic trauma. Um, there is another uh, sort of uh, British, former British protectorate, Yemen, North and South Yemen, that uh, when have, have experienced profound violence since uh, since their sort of unifi unification, and there are countries like North and South Korea, which there, there seems no reunification in sight. And um, Eritrea seceded from Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan from uh, from uh, Sudan, and these are all sort of uh, this is the sort of world reconfiguring itself after the colonial enterprise. And um, and so, you know, one has to 
parse these constructs and understand them within a certain context. I don't, you know, I think the, you know, there are wounds that will remain unhealed and and, and, uh, and some might heal, but I, and, and fiction might play a role in it, but then so can uh, Walbert and then Aisha Jalal. So, you know, it's, uh, these constructs need to be uh, thought of in a more rigorous way. It, and I'd like to address that in that the operative word of your question was easier. Um, it is um, easier to read and contend with some historical fiction that is not very fine, uh, sincere though it may be, as opposed to something like Nomi Ali, which is fiction, but deeply researched and sounds very authentic and as Usma indicated, well, how, will, how much was she to trust what she's found in the library, right? And then of course she took a great leap and went ahead and, and constructed her own uh, fictional world for the readers. Um, and uh, uh, and I'm not saying necessarily that she was uh, being very deliberate about it, although there's something very precise about her writing and her thought processes in the writing. But And one thing leads to another. Um, but I think that um, the final uh, version of that book, uh, although it's not an easy read, is just worth it. So it's a, I can understand a young person won't take something relatively easy. I mean, have, you know, I'm a professor and I teach young students. But um, you know, if to get something genuinely uh, important, um, uh, you know, in terms of opinions and so on and so forth, you really have to work at it. There's no substitute for that. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is, uh, what has been the role of governments in suppressing the literature on partition? Because um, there are two uh, spikes in literature partition, one in uh, Urdu, the local language after partition, Aarti Darya, Rasmus Tobatek Singh, there's reports that uh, the Pakistan government suppressed uh, the partition literature in the local languages, but then as the decades wore on with Papsi Sitwa and the end of the Cold War, uh, new writers emerged who were not subject to Pakistan government uh, pressure because they were writing in English. So that's one government. Uh, what about the British? They seem sensitive about the role of their empire very strangely still. Uh, other governments, like the Indians, uh, uh, if the author would like to address that, along with all the market pressures that stay against, like, you know, uh, new writers emerging or addressing these historical issues. Thank you. Go ahead, anyone. Oh, you didn't hear it, um, HM. Um, governments throughout 20th century have had um, a, uh, have often had a fraught relationship with uh, uh, an official narrative and uh, and uh, other voices and um, and there are um, novelists who have been uh, censored. Um, like uh, Sol Yeltsin, a Nobel Prize winner who was sent to uh, uh, the gulags in, uh, in the former Soviet Union and, uh, and had his, his, his work was uh, brought out on, uh, over a period of years by friends of his uh, on parchments. And, and so, uh, you know, um, it is the way of the world, I um, and, and and you know, with with Ukraine seceding from the construct of uh, the former Soviet Union, uh, in in the minds of in the mind of Putin, it seems that Ukraine is seceding from this idea of Russia, and I'm sure that discourse, fiction or, and, uh, and non-fiction in Russia today will be censored and so this is the way of the world um, uh, but I don't, but you know as far as Adas Naslin 
Arka Darya, Raak, um, and Ice Candy Man. Go, uh, some of the novels that we have uh, chatted about uh, this, during the session, I cannot off the top of my head remember this particular, you know, sort of governments here are taking an official view on them, but perhaps you can tell me more. We have a couple of minutes and I'd like Moniza Shamsi to go ahead and comment because she's a real authority in terms of knowing about partition and uh, on history, on literature, etc. We are, have the honor of having her, her here with us today. She's Samla's mother, as a matter of fact. So could we please go ahead and get a concluding comment from her, we'd be honored. Um, well, you know, taking things by surprise is not a good thing for me. Um, partition, well, there is, uh, I'm actually quite interested in what Hussein said, that throughout the cent 20th century, there was this tendency to ignore narratives and then they start emerging as later generations come. Partition was really such a great trauma, you know, the suffering of it was so great. And it's only recently that I've been reading, uh, such as Salman Rashid's memoirs, beautiful travel memoir, when his family suffered such a trauma, and the trauma was so great that nobody would even talk about it. It was been years. Manizan Alvi has written a British, a beautiful narrative poem at the time of partition. And um, she only discovered two years ago that her father had lost his brother during the, when the family migrated. That father was mentally handicapped. That is a narrative we have never even heard of. What happened to the disadvantage at partition? So it's not only censorship. It is a very, very deep human trauma. And it's very difficult for the people who went through it to come to terms with it. And it, I suppose it will be for future generations to discover what it was what it meant in human terms, and we really should look at politics in human terms more than simply politics and nationhood. Thank you so much, and a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.